number 650. His name is Jesus. Number 652, there is a green hill, number 652. Ten thousand angels. This song will be led in, to help prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper. We're going to sing all four verses, and we'll sing the chorus one time, following the fourth verse. All four verses, then the chorus after the fourth verse.
Our Holy Father in heaven, we thank thee so much for the ultimate sacrifice that you made so long ago for the sins of the world. Our Father, we thank thee for that sacrifice that nailed him to the cruel cross, the suffering that he went through for the pain. Be with us this morning as we partake of this loaf emblematic of that body that was nailed to that tree. Be with us and bless us, Father, in Christ's name.
your song books, number 272. Number 272. This will serve as our song of encouragement, invitation, following the lesson this morning to Brother Sam's. Now, if you would, please turn to number 563. Jesus' name above all names. And if it's convenient for you, would you please stand for the singing of this song? Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, that's where we're going to find the beginning place for our study together this morning. Thank you for being here. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and be with you. I hope that what we have to say today can be a blessing to you and that we can all uh, grow closer to God by the things that we consider together this morning give that a couple other seconds and then I'm going to just shut it off and preach. Um, it wasn't too long ago that I was, I was on Facebook and I saw, I saw a, saw a post that a friend, that a friend had made. And his post 
was just an image of a little tract that they had circulated uh, at the church where he attended. And it was entitled, How to Accept Jesus. And the tract was very simple. It had two verses on it. And then it had a prayer to pray at the conclusion. And I saw that and I felt the need to reach out and say something. What my friend had to say on there I, I didn't think was entirely correct, entirely biblical. And I, I wanted to engage on the topic. So I made the greatest mistake known to man. On an internet article, I went into the comment section. Right? Never go into the comment section. Uh, I decided not to leave a comment in the comment section because that just leads to more trouble. So I sent my buddy a message. I said, hey, could I ask you a little bit about what you posted? I, I didn't want to do it on your page because I know that can just devolve into a mess that ends up not being productive for anybody. He said, sure. And so I, I went and I talked with him a little bit. And I'm going to try this one more time to see if I can get this picture up there. And from that point, we went on to discuss what is actually involved and what it actually means to accept Jesus. And how can we do that? On this tract that, that he had given, the very first verse on there, under the title, How to Accept Jesus, was John 3 and 16. How do you accept Jesus? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse number 2 was Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And following that was the heading that said, pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe that you died and rose from the dead to save me from my sins. I want to be with you in heaven forever. Jesus, forgive me of all my sins that I've committed against you. I open my heart to you now and ask you to come into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So I saw what my friend posted there and I reached out to him said, I, I think I understand some of what you're saying there. I have a little bit of a different view, and I was wondering if we could discuss that. And he said, absolutely. I asked him, I guess what I'm seeing you say here is that we're saved by faith. And he said, yes, it's exactly what I believe. I said, well, tell me, tell me about that faith. I said, is faith a work? I said, and by that I mean, is faith something that you and I do? You know, oftentimes we use words in conversations with folks, especially in a religious context, and we don't take the time to define those words that we're using. And oftentimes we're using the same words, but we're using them in entirely different ways, and we're like ships passing in the night, and we never get anywhere. Because we don't stop and define what we're actually talking about. I said, is faith a work? And by work, I don't mean is this, is this some way in which I save myself, justify myself, forgive myself. By faith being a work, I simply mean, is faith something that I do? Is faith something that you do? Or is faith something that God gives to us? And my friend wrote back, he said, I've, I've never thought of it that way. He said, I never thought of it that way. I think of works as anything I do that in my mind is a factor in me being saved over and above God's grace and faith in Christ Jesus. So that was a word salad there. 
I think of works, my friend said, as anything that I do, the factor in me being saved over and above God's grace and faith in Jesus. So I said, okay. But we're still at that question of faith. Is faith something that you and I do? Or is faith something that is given to us by God? And he said, I I think I'm okay with agreeing that faith or belief can be considered works. So we've made a little bit of progress here. That faith or belief can be considered works in that it is something that I have to do for my salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10, he said. But he said, but I'm still not at a point where I can agree that water baptism is required for being saved. He said, okay, that, that's fine. But we, we've made a little bit of progress here. And we've kept up the conversation in various ways through, through the past several months. But it's that last point that he made. Where he said, I, I think I'm okay with agreeing that belief or faith is a work that we do. Not that we're saving ourselves, but it's something that we have to do in order to be saved. But I'm not at the point where I believe that water baptism is a requirement for being saved. I want to talk about that last point this morning. In the context of accepting Jesus and what it means to accept Jesus and how it is that we can accept Jesus. And here's where I want us to start. Uh, Are you there with me in John chapter 3 and verse 16? We're going to read this passage together. I know many of us, maybe even all of us could quote it, but let's read it together. And the first thing I want you to think about this morning is in, in, in in this broad heading of how to accept Jesus. Number one, how do we read Scripture? How is it that you and I read Scripture? Now we're here in John chapter 3 and verse 16. What is commended to us in John chapter 3 and verse 16? John chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is one thing that is commanded in this passage. There is one thing that is commended to us in this passage, and that is what? Belief. God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so mental note of that. Belief. God commands belief. God commends belief to us. Let's look at the other passage that was quoted in that tract. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. In the context here where where Paul is, is talking about how he wanted his brethren, according to the flesh, the Israelites, to be saved... Uh, But the problem was they had gone about setting up their own righteousness and had not submitted to the righteousness of God that is revealed through the gospel. And as you come down to Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, Paul starts to talk about how it is that men and women are saved. How it is that they come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. How it is that men and women today accept Jesus Christ. And beginning in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, we read this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So in John chapter 3 and verse 16, what was commanded? Belief. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, what was commanded? Now we've got two things, don't we? What was commanded to us? Belief and confession. So two things. So in John 3, we only had one thing. In Romans 10, we've got two things. So evidently, we're not just going to one passage of Scripture, my friend isn't, to try to understand God's will for salvation. We've got two passages. 
How do we settle on those two passages? Do those two passages represent the sum total of what God wants you and me to do in order to be saved? And my friend kind of anticipated where we were going with that, right? Because he, he put it, even before I mentioned anything about baptism, he said, but I'm not at the point where I can accept water baptism as a requirement for salvation. I wasn't even going to baptism yet. Okay. You notice something that's left out of that tract? When we got John 3 and we've got Romans 10, what have we left out? Well, baptism, and that was an obvious one. There's some other stuff left out there, isn't there? Let me ask you this question. In John 3 and Romans 10, is that the entirety of God's will to people today concerning salvation? If it is, we might ask, where's baptism? And I think that's a logical question to ask. But here's another question to ask. Where's repentance? Where's repentance? Is repentance necessary? Now, I know what my friend is going to say, because he's told me before. Repentance is necessary. So if repentance is necessary, we've got something more than what? We've got something more than John 3.16. We've got something more than Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. We've got something more than what this tract presents to us. I, I, I don't think this is the only passage, nor is it probably the, the, the passage that we ought to refer to to establish the reality that you and I need to repent in order to be saved as part of a process. But nonetheless, Jesus' words in Luke 13 and verse 3 stand pretty clearly. I'll read it very quickly. Jesus says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, very evidently, Jesus in that context is going to commend repentance to his audience, command it. My friend would tell me, yes, repentance is necessary. Several friends that I've had this kind of discussion with would tell me, yes, Repentance is necessary. But if we can establish, if we establish that repentance is necessary for salvation, that tells me a couple of things. Number one, that tells me that there's more to salvation than just two verses. And this tract, as well-meaning as it is and as thoughtful as it is, doesn't give the whole story. That it's lacking, that it's flawed. That it's simply wrong. Not because somebody was intentionally trying to obfuscate reality or to hide truth, but somebody was just, I choose to think, just sincerely mistaken. That there's more to our responsibility to God than simply believing and confessing and praying a particular prayer. So if repentance is necessary, number one, there's more to salvation than just two verses. And number two, we have to be able to harmonize Scripture in order to understand God's will. Remember, heading number one here that we're talking about, how do we read Scripture? If you and I can come to the understanding that, yes, repentance is necessary, that's going to tell us that what we have to do in order to understand God's will regarding salvation is be able to take all that God says and work through it. And not simply take a verse here and a verse there and declare that this is the sum total of God's will regarding salvation. So if we've established that we need to be able to harmonize Scripture, that there's more to salvation than just two verses, let's move on to this question. We, we've answered how do we read Scripture. We've got to be able to take God's Word as it is presented and we've got to work through it as a whole. So number two. Question number two, do I play a role in my salvation? Do I play a role in my salvation? Do you play a role in your salvation? If I'm saved, if you're saved, who plays a role in that, if anybody? 
Is it all God? Is it all me? Is it some sort of us working together? What does that look like? Come back to John 3. Let's go back to John 3. John chapter 3. And let's go back to verse 12. John chapter 3 and verse 12. Here is Jesus still in this discussion with Nicodemus. Uh, back to verse 10, chapter 3 and verse 10. Jesus said to Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel? And you don't understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak what we know and we bear witness of that which we have seen and you do not witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Now verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's my question to you. As we're trying to understand whether or not I play a role in my salvation, who believes in John chapter 3 and verse 16? Who was responsible for belief in John chapter 3 and verse 16? And we see the answer right there in the middle that whoever or whosoever or whomsoever, depending on how your translation reads. The one that is responsible for belief is the individual. You're responsible for belief. I'm responsible for belief. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In verses 9 and 10. Who's responsible for belief? And who's responsible for confession? In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, if you confess with what? Your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in what? Your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The one who is going to be saved is the one who is responsible for what? Believing and confessing, believing with their own heart and confessing with their own tongue. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Let's look at a New Testament passage that does address you and me today that talks about repentance. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We're not even going to touch baptism right now. I just want you to think here about repentance for a moment. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Here on the day of Pentecost, Peter turns to, to a crowd of people who have come to believe and says to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now here's a passage that commands repentance today, right? Who's commanded to repent in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? Well, as we work through the context here, going back to verse 36, it's the people who had sinned, right? They had put to death Jesus Christ. And the people who in verse 37 believed because they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles what shall we do we've, we've sinned we've put to death the one that God sent to give us life what in the world can we do to be forgiven of what we've done who was commanded to repent the ones that believed the ones that had sinned and the ones who would be saved who would be forgiven so we look at John 3, we look at Romans 10, we look at Acts 2, and we come back to our question. Question number two, do I play a role in my salvation? Who's believing in John chapter 3? 
I am, the individual. Who's believing and confessing in Romans chapter 10? It's me, it's my tongue, it's my heart. Who's repenting in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? The one who has sinned, the one who believes, and the one who is seeking to be forgiven. Do I play a role in my salvation? Well, let's look at this the other way. If I play no role in my salvation, that is, and there are some people that believe this, if, if, if I play no role whatsoever in my salvation, and salvation is strictly and only from God, God does it all, and I play no role in it. God chooses me, bang, you're saved. Doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you want, doesn't matter any of that. God chose you, you're saved, and that's it then does John 3.16 make any sense whatsoever? If you and I play no role, if it's all God and none of me, does John chapter 3 and verse 16 make any sense? We're not even talking about baptism passages, are we? Does John 3.16 make any sense? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What about Romans? Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 makes even less sense. If I play no role in my salvation, confessing with my mouth, believing in my heart, but if God does it all and I play no role, that doesn't make any sense, does it? And if God does it all, how in the world could Peter call people to repent of their sins? If that's not me repenting, that's God doing it for me. Do I play a role? These three passages would seem to indicate that, but let, let's go back to our little tract. Pretend you can see the tract up here. Isn't it real nice? Okay. Remember what's at the bottom of that tract? No, you don't remember because it wasn't up there, but I told you. Do you remember? The prayer, the sinner's prayer, right? Let me ask you something about that. Remember the title of the tract, How to Accept Jesus. John 3.16, Romans 10.9, and then what? Pray this prayer. Who prays the sinner's prayer? To my friend, it's, it's the one who wants to be saved, right? But that's us doing something, isn't it? In the strictest sense, that's a what? That's a work. My friend would say, and I would agree with him, not a work where I'm trying to save myself, but a work where I'm reaching out to the grace of God that's been offered. Now, I think the way you're going about it with the sinner's prayer is wrong. But I can see that my friends who believe in that are not saying that they're saving themselves, but they're appealing to God's grace. But it's still something that what? It's still something we do. We have a role to play. And think about this. If I play no role in my salvation, look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, if I play no role in my salvation, that may sound kind of good on the surface that God chooses. And that if God chooses you to be saved, you're going to be saved no matter what, and your ticket is punched, and you're going, and you're off to glory, and isn't that grand? And I suppose for that person in that scenario, that is pretty grand. But that scenario only, only covers half the story. Because if there are people that God chose, well, then there are people that God didn't choose. And if I play no role in my salvation, if I play no role in my salvation, then God decides who's going to be saved, all of his own will, without anything that we do. But God also decides who's going to be lost. Not based on anything that we do, 
just based on a choice of his. That's the dark side of this teaching that says salvation is all of God and man plays absolutely no role whatsoever. The dark side of that is, what about the lost people? Why are they lost? In the system of theology that says you and I play no role in our salvation, people are lost because God chose them to be lost. But I'm looking at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Are you there with me? I'm looking at Matthew 23, 37, and here's what Jesus said as he looked over Jerusalem before, before he would be uh, arrested, ultimately tried, and crucified. He looks over the city and mourns. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets and kills those who were sent to her. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I would have saved you. I would have protected you. I would have nurtured you. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but what, Jesus says. It's really important. Jesus says what? But you were not willing. Jesus doesn't say, but I was not willing. Jesus doesn't say, but the Father was not willing. Jesus doesn't say, but the Spirit was not willing. Jesus says what? You were not willing. Who had the choice in the matter? The individual did. The person did. You and I have that choice. How often I would have gathered you together, how often I would have saved you, would have protected you, would have nurtured you. Jesus says, but you rejected me. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. What Peter says here, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness. But he is long-suffering towards us. God is long-suffering towards us, not willing what? Not willing that any should perish. How, how could we reconcile 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, God is not willing that any should perish, with a doctrine that says you play no role in your salvation, God chooses whether you're saved or lost, irrespective of anything you ever do. Those two concepts don't work together, do they? We've got to take one or the other. We've got to take a religious theology that says God chooses on the basis of nothing you've ever done. Or we've got to choose the words of Scripture in Matthew 23 and verse 37 and 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 and passages like that. I know what I'm going to choose. So that goes back to our first point, how we read Scripture. I'm going to choose what I see revealed in God's Word. I'm going to let Scripture reveal to me who God is and what God wants and what God wants from me. So do I play a role in my salvation? John 3, Romans 10, Acts 2 would all say what? Yes, I play a role in my salvation. And if we're talking about us doing something, we can strictly call that what? Works. It's what my friend did, remember? He said, I think, I, I, I haven't thought of it that way before, but I think I can agree with the idea of calling faith or belief a work. It's not something in which we're saving ourselves, but it's something we do that God has called us to do. I'm right there with you, man. Absolutely 100% agree. That's what I mean when I'm using the term work here. I'm not trying to say that I save myself, that I redeem myself, that I take away my own sin. I don't believe that. But speaking to my friend, just like you, I believe there are some things that God wants us to do, that God calls on us to do, that God commands us to do. I agree with you. God commands us to believe. 
I agree with you that God commands us to believe, to confess. We agree that God commands us to repent. But then we get to the sticky one, don't we? We get to baptism. And he said, I, I just don't think that I can agree that water baptism is a requirement for being saved. And my question back is simple. Why? Why? And the answer commonly goes something like this, because if I'm doing something then that nullifies God's grace. If I'm doing something, then grace is no longer grace. We'll go back to John 3. Does my role, here's our question, question number three, and here's our last one. Does my role nullify God's grace? Does the fact that I have a role to play, does that somehow mitigate, nullify, cancel God's grace. Well, you're looking here at John chapter 3 and verse 16. To whom does grace and salvation belong? Grace and salvation ultimately comes through whom? Comes from the Father and comes through Jesus, right? For God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So ultimately, grace and salvation come from the Father. So here's my question. If God chooses to impose conditions on salvation, does that nullify grace? If God chooses to say, if you want what I'm offering, you've got to do X, Y, Z. Do X, Y, and Z nullify God's grace? And here's the simple answer. My friend recognized it doesn't nullify God's grace when it's belief. He said, that's a work. We have to do it. We do it in response to God's offer of grace. We're not nullifying grace. We're submitting to God's grace. Okay. So belief does not nullify grace. Not confession. No. Confession is something we've got to do. And it's something that we do in response to God's offer. Okay. I'm right there with you. So belief does not nullify grace. Neither does confession nullify grace. Neither does repentance nullify grace. So if we recognize that belief does not nullify grace, if we recognize that confession does not nullify grace, if we recognize that repentance does not nullify grace, why all of a sudden when we come to baptism, does baptism nullify grace? Where's the logic? And I gently submit to you, it's not there. The logic is not there. Because if we can recognize that I play a role in my salvation and that involves belief and repentance and confession and that I do these things in response to God's offer of salvation, in response to God's grace, and by me doing these, I'm not nullifying God's grace but submitting to it, why is baptism any different? Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And let's talk about baptism for just a second. Look at Acts chapter 2 and 38. Because in this passage, God joins together two concepts. What are they? Repentance and baptism. And through the Holy Spirit, God places both repentance and baptism prior to what? The forgiveness of sins. They turned to Peter and the rest of the apostles and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter responded and said, Repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Does baptism nullify God's grace? Here is God joining together repentance and baptism. He's not nullifying his own grace by doing that. Or think about Mark 16 and verse 16. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Here in this passage, God joins together what? Belief and baptism. Does that nullify God's grace? No more so than John 3.16 does. No more so than Romans 10, 9 and 10 do. You see, just because I have a role to play, that doesn't nullify God's grace. It doesn't cancel it out. God has a role in our salvation. And his role is grace. His role is grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. How? By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God plays a role in our salvation. What is that role? He plays the role of grace. And then there's a role that you and I play and what is that role? It's described succinctly here in Ephesians 2 as what? As faith. And I would have you look just very briefly at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 to get a better idea of what faith is. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the Hebrew writer talks to us about faith. After introducing a very basic concept of faith in chapter 11 and verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, we come to verse 6 and we get a real working definition of what faith is. The Hebrew writer says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So again, we're talking about pleasing God, being in a relationship with God, being saved. It's impossible to be saved without faith. But what is faith? For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Two components to faith here. There's a mental aspect and then there's a practical aspect. Faith embraces not just what we believe. Faith embraces what we do. And as we've seen this morning... There, there are some things that God calls us to do. He calls us to believe. He calls us to confess. He calls us to repent. But he also calls us to be baptized. Not to save ourselves. And look at Colossians 2 and here's where we end this morning. He calls us to be baptized not to save ourselves... Not to take away our own sin, not to nullify His grace or anything like that. Could I submit to you that God calls us to be baptized because baptism is an act of faith? Look at Colossians 2 with me. Look at verse 11. In Him that is in Christ, in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, verse 12, 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him, how? Raised up with him through faith. Faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism does not nullify grace. Baptism doesn't nullify faith. It embraces God's grace. It embraces faith. It is an act of faith. It is part and parcel to faith. Baptism is faith in that sense. I'm not being baptized to take away my own sin. I'm not being baptized because I'm so good and I'm presenting myself before God in that way. I'm being baptized. Why? Because in being buried and rising again, I'm coming into contact with Jesus. With God's grace that's available through His blood. And that by means of faith, God takes away my sin and makes me whole. He looks down and He says, you're forgiven. On account of your faith, by my grace that's extended in Jesus Christ. Pray for my friend. We're still talking. I'm sure you have friends like my friend that you're talking to in your own life. Little by little, step by step, progress comes. Sometimes we think we have to win these, these discussions all in, in one three-hour marathon conversation. That's really just probably not going to happen. But if we can see these little opportunities, if we can reason together, we can accomplish something. I appreciate your good attention this morning. If you look at your life and you're outside of a relationship with God, maybe you've never come to Jesus Christ like we've talked about this morning. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus. Would you accept him this morning in the manner that we've talked about, in the manner that we've demonstrated from Scripture? We'd love to help you. Maybe as a Christian you look at your life and you haven't been living as you should. And you want to come back to the one who loved you and gave himself for you. If we can help you respond to the gospel in any way this morning, would you come while we stand and while we sing?
turn in your song books to number 72. This will be the last, final song of our service this morning. Be with me, Lord. I have one question to ask you. Can you use what you heard this morning to teach someone about Jesus? I believe you can. Thank you, Tyler, for the lesson today. Both lessons today. Looking forward to being able to spend the remainder of our time through Wednesday evening with Brother Tyler Sams. And, and if you're in our area again today, those of you that are visiting especially, if you can be back this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'll meet again. Uh, Tyler will present to us another lesson for us to be able to open God's Word together. If you're also in our area this week, the remainder of this week, at least Monday through Wednesday, we'll be meeting at 7 p.m. each night for other more lessons from Brother Tyler. We appreciate your presence if you're visiting with us. If you are leaving this afternoon, please be careful going to your destination. And know this, that you are welcome to come back and worship with us at any time you are with us in the Fort Smith area. Thank you. For those of our own number, uh, there is a meal list back there on the bulletin board. If, if there's some blank spots on it, fill those out today so Tyler doesn't have to feed himself while he's here. <laughs> I don't think he'll miss any meals like I don't miss any meals. So, but uh, there are, I believe there are a couple empty spots there. So be mindful of those and uh, let's show him the hospitality that he deserves while he's here. Is there anything else that we need to announce before we sing this song? At the conclusion of this song then, Brother David Bushnock will dismiss us in prayer. Number 72, verses 1 and 4. Thank you for watching the live stream of our worship this morning. The members of Park Hill would like to invite you to join us in person if you are ever in our area for a Bible study at 9.30 a.m. Sunday mornings, for our worship assembly at 10.15, and our Sunday evening worship at 5 p.m. We also have Bible study classes for all ages Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Come back and join us at 5 p.m. this evening when we will live stream our worship on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you and have a wonderful day.